Welcome to the Listen Up Podcast, where we explore hearing loss, communication, connections, and health. Hey, everybody. Dr. Mark Sims here. I'm the host of the Listen Up Podcast, where I, I feature leaders in healthcare. This episode is brought to you by uh, Listen Up Hearing Centers. I help patients to effectively treat their hearing loss to remain independent and continue to be socially connected. The reason I'm so passionate about hearing loss is because I lost my brother, Robbie, twice. I lost him first to hearing loss from radiation to his brain tumor, and then I lost him again from complications to his brain tumor. I am the E of ENT. I only treat ears. I've cared for, I've done over 10,000 surgeries and cared for thousands of patients with hearing loss, and I'm passionate about getting them treated well. I, I have written a book called Listen Up, A Physician's Guide to Effectively Treating Your Hearing Loss. If you want to learn more about that, go to listenuphearing.com. I'm also at Arizona Hearing Center, where you can learn more about my clinical practice. I'm very excited today. Today, I have Christine Menapace. She is the Vice President for Cochlear Corporation of Clinical Quality and Regulatory Affairs. She leads a team of 40 professionals that focus on clinical strategy, including research, expanding indications, surgical and audiological technical support and clinical care. It's a big job and she does a great job at it. She is a bachelor's of arts in communications disorder from University of Northern Colorado and a master's of arts in communication disorders audiology from San Diego State in San Diego, California. That's where it is, amazingly. I'm excited for her to be here and this is gonna be a great conversation. Christine, thanks, we got over the technical problems. We're here, let's talk, how are you doing? I'm great, Mark, how are you? Nice I'm to talk excellent. with you. Thanks for coming today. Good. Listen, I want to know, how did you get into audiology? I'm always interested in people's origin story. Uh, yeah, well, great question. So I kind of have um, quite the path, actually. So I think, you know, I grew up in a really small town in Southern Colorado and probably wasn't getting the best career advice one could get at that age um, and actually wanted to be a fashion designer. So those who know me wouldn't be surprised by that, but uh, that would have been what I would have told my guidance counselor in high school that I wanted to do. Uh, he didn't love that so much and was like, how about a teacher? And I knew I wanted to help people and make a difference in the world. But I also knew that probably being a teacher or a social worker wasn't the right path for me. So uh, my stepmother was a speech language pathologist. And I would, um, on my summer break, go with her. She worked in LA Unified School District and see her and see the work she did. And I thought, oh, I'll bet I like this. I could probably do that. So I actually went to college thinking I would be an SLP. And fairly early on, I was like, SLP is not for me. But I did like and embrace the hearing and the science and uh, that very close relationship they have at that undergraduate level at that time. So I embraced the idea of becoming an audiologist and treating people with hearing disorders and making my impact that way. Um, so you had to, at that point, had to get a master's degree and then a year fellowship to do that. And so by the time I made it to the end of that master's degree, I also knew I didn't want to be a practicing clinician in audiology. Um, also wanted to come back to Colorado from California. And I came back. And again, this was in 1990. So well, long before the internet was the way we communicated and marketed ourselves. And so I started sending letters out to anybody who had a CFY possibility, meaning they were certified by the American Academy of Audiology to mentor me for my last year of training. And I happened to send one to Judy Brimacomb, who was the then vice president at Cochlear Americas. And she was so kindly responded to me via a letter. And that letter really changed my world. So I went in for my first interview at Cochlear, uh, right out of graduate school, really. And what I was interviewing for was the first customer service rep. So if you think about the size of cochlear then, and at that point, all over the world, there were only 3,500 people implanted with cochlear implants when I started. And it was the first customer service job that they were starting there. So they were finally getting enough business in the United States that they needed that. And they thought that my background in hearing and being able to understand the technology would be a great fit. So I took the job, moved to Denver. And still needed to finish my fellowship. So they then very graciously sponsored a research fellowship where I worked with uh, what was then the Denver Ear Institute and Dr. John Shellop and David Kelsall and finished my fellowship and my training to be an audiologist as a research cochlear implant audiologist. 
And then at some point I had to make a decision about if I wanted to stay working with patients and doing research or if I wanted to take more of the corporate path, um, which again, based on what you just said about me, is pretty obvious what I chose. And I stayed and continued to, you know, learn and hone my skills in clinical research and study design and working with the Food and Drug Administration, trying to do training and education. And like, as you said, now, really a lot of my focus is on that care model and how does that help us build that whole continuum around access and awareness and probably more important, importantly, accessibility to the technology, which I think are all probably sorely lacking even today. Well, uh, that's an awesome story. Now, what I want you to know from my perspective, knowing you personally, you haven't given up on the patient care side, even though you might have on the uh, organizational chart. So true, in spirit, true. you're very much involved in that, perhaps more than some of the people who portend to be on the patient care side. So uh, I'll just leave it at that. I'm not trying to. Well, thank you for that. I still feel like everything I do helps maybe not one patient every day, but hopefully thousands of patients every day. So thank you for acknowledging that. I appreciate it. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, what what big things are you working on now? Um, well, as I just mentioned, really a lot of focus probably over the last couple of years is trying to look at that care model, meaning how does somebody first find out about a cochlear implant? There's a whole group of people looking at that, about the awareness and the education to even get people to acknowledge that a CI might be a treatment option for them. And then where myself and my team have come in on what happens once they walk into a clinic such as yours and start to talk with a professional about a cochlear implant and is it the right treat treatment option for them. And then we've looked at everything that happens in that first year of that patient journey. And you do see that there are a lot of visits um, associated with a cochlear implant. Um, I always say, I always joke and say, in my 30 years in this industry, the one thing that hasn't changed is the patient care model, right? Back when I started to do cochlear implants, it was very clear why you needed to see somebody frequently and eight or nine, ten, ten times in the first year. The technology was much more antiquated, the way we mapped and programmed. We didn't have imaging. We didn't have tools to give us feedback from the nerve to tell us that it was working and stimulating. It was all sort of hit or miss with oscilloscopes hooked up and DOS-based software. And for whatever reason, that stuck. And it never really changed as the technology changed and allowed us to say, wow, we don't have to see someone who gets a cochlear implant nine times in the first year. You know, I've gone out and looked and I haven't found any type of treatment option from a pacemaker to a knee replacement to, you know, probably transplants to some degree where you see patients as often as we have, we see the people who get a cochlear implant. And what that does is that creates a bottleneck and uh, a lot of inefficiency and probably lack of cost effectiveness in providing the treatment. So spending a lot of time saying, what are those critical points when they do need to be seen by an audiologist or a physician and what should be happening for that recipient to get the best benefit and then move on? So we've been focusing a lot on that and happy to say that uh, the evidence-based model we've produced has really reduced those encounters from on average about nine times in the first year for most cochlear implant recipients in the U.S down to four. And we were able to show that you could get the same benefit and the same outcome, yet not have the patient having to return to the clinic as often. And thinking about more what is patient-centered care. And I think that is moving it in the right direction. Next step will be to layer on technology such as telehealth and, and things that patients can do remotely or do themselves, as opposed to having to have an audiologist um, do that for them. So pretty excited about that because it does open up capacity opportunities. So, you know, a clinic could in theory treat 25, 30, maybe even 40% more patients every year than they do now just by looking at their evaluation schedule and reducing the number of times they see those patients. So when you do the outcomes, you're doing audiologic outcomes or what are, when you say the outcomes are the same? Well, because speech has been such a mainstay in terms of how we look at the success and outcomes of a cochlear implant recipient. And probably to be honest, any way we measure outcomes in those treated with any type of hearing technology. Uh, yes, I will say speech. And then I will say we also looked at quality of life and patient, simple patient satisfaction. Was I satisfied with my experience? You know, right. and that allows you to question, is it the patient or is it the professional that needs to be seeing them? Um, frequently and often. And we found that they were 
very satisfied with the experience they had, and they reached those same speech perception levels with essentially less mapping, probably a little less counseling, right? If they needed it, it was there. Very few veered off that schedule, meaning they didn't come back saying, I really need you, I need more help, or I'm not doing well. Um, so I think, again, it's just changing that mindset about what it takes in 2021 to uh, get a patient to the, a successful outcome with a cochlear implant. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you 100%, you know, for the mainstream ones. Obviously, there are kind of those uh, consumptive patients with the psychosocial issues that are more challenging. And that's where I see actually freeing up some capacity to be able to spend time with the ones who need more support. Um, in that right. Respect. And that's even a benefit of it, right? And it, oddly enough, it, it sounds kind of corny, but it is about 80-20. 80% really yes. can be on their way with four visits and 20% absolutely need more support. Keep in mind, I'm solely talking about adults right now, right? Pediatrics. Right. And, uh, very yes, yes, 100%. Uh, um, children right. is a whole but, other ball of wax. But if you free up all that time that the 80% don't need, then you can absolutely help dedicate it to those who need it more. And I also acknowledge that as we continue to see uh, the age and time at implantation uh, continue to get older, those individuals may need more support in the future. And this allows us to be able to treat 90 year old successfully that are healthy and still get a great outcome from them because they will need a little bit more support, especially with the technology. Yeah, it was interesting. I saw a 91-year-old today who's a cochlear implant candidate. And my favorite was she said, well, I know a lot about them since my son has one. So, <laughs> like, so her son's hearing loss had gotten so severe that it was clear that he could benefit, but she's still on the on the fence because, you know, she's like, well, it did him right well. You know, in her defense, she's like, well, I'm 91. I don't know if I want to do it. But I was kind of like, wow, that's a change where an yeah, elderly exactly. patient using their offspring as the index yeah. of what <laughs> it, does this technology work? I was like, I don't think I've heard that before. No, I don't, I've definitely not heard that before. I'm going to remember that. That's a good story. You'll have to let me know what she uh, chooses to do. <laughs> but, and that was totally one where I just said, you know, if you want to do it, learn more about it. We'll do an evaluation. And if you don't, that's okay too. You know, obviously right. I think that's yeah. always okay. But in that particular patient population, you certainly don't want to move people to an intervention when there are associated right. risks. Good, yeah, how about identifying those patients beforehand? To me, that's been kind of the holy grail. Like who are the psychosocially consumptive patients before implantation? That would, to me, be like the, uh, the, 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 the thing that we would do because then we could predict our resources based on that. Because one of the things is, yeah, I well, think the reason we do eight or nine visits is because we're assuming the worst. And so yeah, if we could gratify exactly. them, like, okay, you're a four-visit guy and you're an eight-visit guy, right? Because that's really what we have to figure out. Not, oh, well, we could have seen them all in four visits, but we gave eight because that's what we always do. Right. Uh, so good questions. I think, and again, I'm saying this, I'm knowing about some research that's going on right now, but I think there's some very fundamental things that we really haven't focused intently on or as much as we maybe should have over these years when we've been trying to predict outcomes, right? We've always focused on, well, where did they start with their hearing loss? Oh, five, 10 percent speech discrimination abilities, and we take them to 60, but yet there's still a patient who's still dissatisfied or doesn't do well in noise or isn't well, maybe you should be dissatisfied with a 60 percent word recognition score right i mean it's it's, it's well less if you bad. started with zero it's still a delta of 60 percent right so there is probably uh, some of that is where you start will dictate to some degree where you end up but i think there's things like really looking at core mobility factors that would impact that inner ear right other high blood pressure diabetes things that we know impact uh, the vascular systems and other things that are really important for that inner ear. The other one that I'm very keen and would strongly suggest folks start to do is a cognitive screener, because I think those two alone will yes. contribute a lot to the variability in the outcomes that we see. And when I do say that, I'll often get asked, you know, well, I'm going to implant someone anyway. So what's the cognitive screener really doing for me? And I'm like, it's not going to tell you whether you should implant them or not, but it is absolutely going to tell you how much support they're going to need post-surgery, right? And so well, I mean, it's the I counseling think, issue, right? It's a counseling right. issue. Yeah. Well, and understanding what can they take in, what maybe it needs right. to be more spaced out. Maybe they need different support. Maybe you need to rely more on a caregiver or a family member to help them out. But I think those two things 
we will see will help us account for the variability in outcomes and in some way then predict it. I don't I don't know if I don't know if anything in medicine, maybe you could tell me we'll ever get to where you go get a knee replaced and someone's going to tell you you're going to get all your range of motion back, right? I, I think we're always going to have some degree of unknown, but I think you'll absolutely be able to pinpoint better what people need. This technology is really amazing because very few people don't get better in what we're trying to do, which is restore audibility and the ability to discriminate and understand and produce speech. Um, where it does still fall probably short is in speech and noise, understanding and noisy yes. restaurants. But again, that's where you and I and anyone else has the most difficulty too. It's the most complex environment. So yeah. I think there's some improvements there to be had, but I absolutely believe with more confidence you could tell a recipient how they would do by simply looking at their cognitive state and other comorbidities that may be impacting that auditory system that we just don't know about today. Yeah, I think one of the issues is the paradigm, right? Because the paradigm is, well, I'm going to implant them anyway. No, the real question is, is, you know, even when you look at kind of the dialogues we have, we really shouldn't be talking about the people we're going to implant. It's like, okay. Who are the people everybody in the room decided not to implant and why? Right. right? Because those are actually the hardest yeah. one is when you like bring them and you say like, no, no, I, I, we really, this technology, I mean, we, you know, the technical insertion is not difficult. It's the, you know, ensuring that they get an outcome commensurate with their expectation and what really should happen. Like, I mean, if somebody's cognitively impaired where they need a care provider, I'm not saying they shouldn't right. get one, but that's a much more like I would want a cognitive screen because you might say to them and say to the family, right. well, you know, yes, but maybe no, maybe we shouldn't do this. And I think really we need to have exactly. a more of a dialogue about who not to implant. And I know that sounds strange, yep. but if we talk about those people, then actually I think the the pathway or the capacity will open up. Absolutely agree because it does, again, it increases the confidence that when we say you are a good candidate, you absolutely are going to get a good outcome. I agree with you. I think it goes both directions and that's that's good feedback. I do like that. I mean, interestingly enough, most cochlear implant clinics, and it'd be interesting to even know in your own, it, they will say there's very few people that make it to my door through that very hard journey to even identify that a cochlear implant is out there that absolutely aren't candidates. There's very few that I don't implant because by the time they've gone through that challenging obstacle path to get to me, um, they're pretty much a candidate, right? So. Uh -huh. I guess, uh, so, you know, our philosophical approach, as you know, has been, uh, I say we're sometimes, you know, a little bit more of a rigorous process. And so we kind of make people own the process because it, if you put some resistance and make them get there, and I, I tell you, when we lay out what we expect of people, I'd say about one in 30, we'll send it over, write a very nice note, you know, Dr. Sims, I've thought about it. And I don't really think this is for me right now. And from my perspective, I, I I want them to get what they want for them, but I consider that a little right. bit of a, like, this is a good thing, right? When people actually have reflected upon the commitment to do the oral rehabilitation, you know, even four visits, you know, I mean, like I've told people, like, you can't get it the first time right. and then say, well, I don't like the drive anymore. I'm not going to come, right? Like they need some programming, right? <laughs> and so, yeah. you know, when somebody says no to me, I, you know, I say, well, that's maybe a victory of our screening process where, right. you know. Well, because you really want people who are going to go to the whole finish line, right? And so one of it's the, the uh, idea that the finish line is implantation. And I think that's just the beginning. Oh, the finish is line is audibility, beginning. right? And so people yep. think that the, the real carrot is getting the implant, but the real carrot is getting hearing. And people don't think exactly. about that. Right. No, good points. I completely agree. But even one in 30, that means, you know, what is 29 are getting and 100 are walking away. That's pretty good. Well, well, wait, wait, wait. Now, now these are the people who qualify. I mean, we have a decent number of people who don't qualify because we're looking at, you know, we're, we're looking at, you know, I actually had one of our AUD students come to me the other day, right? So there's the 60, 60 rule, right? And we know with the 60, 60 rule, most of those patients are going to be cochlear implant candidates. It doesn't mean the antithesis, like that everybody who doesn't meet the 60-60 rule oh, is yeah. not a cochlear implant candidate. And I was trying to say this soon. I said, look, I sent this patient because they have, you know, 10% to scrim on one side, 
and they have like 78% to scrim on the other side. Mm -hmm. I said, but you don't know what their capacity is going to be in noise, right? Right. So that was one of the things, like when you get these rules, sometimes say, well, that means if you're in the 60-60, we look, and if you're not, we don't, but that's not really the answer, right? And so it's obviously contextual of each patient. And you know what, if that patient turns out not to be a CI candidate, we see that as a service, right? Because we've demonstrated to you that this technology is not the right technology for you today. And as you know, hearing loss is a continuum. It might be two years from now. Right. And ideally, they showed up at your door and you're going to get them fit and what they need. So it might not be a CI today. And I think that's where the 60-60 rule is nice because it is pulling people in and then allows a professional that is very knowledgeable across not only implantable technology, but hearing aids and other assistive devices to help them support and find out what it is they truly need today. And then they are aware of the technology if it comes to the point in time when they do need it. So I think it all works quite well. I quite like that campaign in terms of raising awareness and at least getting people to, you know, turn the light bulb on and say, hmm, maybe I, no. maybe there is another option out there for me. Agreed 100%. It's, it's just kind of keeping that mindset. And I don't think you're in contradiction of this, that, you know, hearing treatment is a, is a continuum and a reassessment, it right? Is. Like, I mean, it'd be kind of like, well, you know, my primary care doctor put me on this blood pressure pill 40 years ago. And so that's what I'm still on. <laughs> well, there are developments and maybe we should check your blood right. pressure again. Exactly. Right? Like, so- it's a continual thing. It's not, and that was, it's not as common now when I first started, people would say, well, I was evaluated for a cochlear implant eight years ago. And they told me I wasn't a candidate. And I was going, you mean a candidate yet, right? I mean, yeah. it's like your hearing was normal and it's progressive, right? You, so. Bingo, bingo. But it'd yeah. be interesting to know what interval to do it back. I do every two years, but I, or if there's a change, I don't really know if the data supports how often you should reassess them. That'd be an interesting question. Yeah, I mean it's hard. I think on average. Did you when, give me that answer uh, by Monday? Large, you have the data. Yeah, to take a look well, at large it. institutes that I know have looked at the progression of hearing loss in large number of populations over time. They will say on average a progressive sensory neural hearing loss of you know whether it's high you know noise induced or unknown one origin DB a year. probably pro- probably progresses about one dB a year. I don't you know. But I'm going to tell I think you that's a hard number. Yeah, that's also everyone. And so the real right. answer is, is the cochlear implant candidates, obviously, unless they were born at negative 40 years, you see what I'm saying? Like for them, like they're at 65 and they've got a 75 dB hearing loss. So they had to, based on that formula, they had to start losing their hearing at right. minus 10 years. So these are obviously a stratified group of fast, faster loser, losing their hearing faster. Yeah, agree. We agree. And I guess, you know, there is some merit to, you know, for our vision, we're suggested it gets checked as a screener every year. So what would it hurt to do an audiogram on those recipients or those potential candidates or hearing impaired population, whatever we want to refer to them as annually, just to get them in the habit. So we catch those who are going to progress much faster. And for those who maybe follow that one dB slow progression over time, at least they know that and they have the confidence that they are monitoring it. So I kind of like the idea of annually um, knowing that we'll catch some and many will continue to go for a period of years. Yeah, it's a fascinating disease. I mean, the, the biggest thing that I think is so hard about hearing loss is people don't know what they're not hearing. Right. And, and if <laughs> exactly. you really think about that, it's like, it's so much different than any other disease, right? Like, well, you don't know right. what you didn't hear, right? Like, is which is always like people say, well, my hearing aid, people say, come back and see me if you need me. I was like, well, how do you know if you need them if you just stop hearing things that you don't know you're not hearing? It was like putting a reader on. I didn't know I needed them until I put them on. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and it's uh, like, oh, yes, I need them. <laughs> yes, the, the letters look much crisper when I actually have those cheaters. <laughs> exactly. <on them. laughs> well, exactly. So, so where do you see this going in five, 10 years from now? Oh, you know, I think there's so many exciting things happening just in the hearing space with, you know, the introduction of uh, some of these gene therapy companies, pharmaceuticals. I think the implantable technology will continue to get better. I think not only will those improvements come through the product and continue to enhance it and improve those more difficult listening environments, I think we'll continue to see technology become more cosmetically appealing to the candidates and the recipients that have to wear it every day. Um, I would like to say that we'll see people really embracing this idea of treating both ears because ultimately what we're trying to do is get the brain be able to synergize that input and make the most sense of it, right? Right. And, you know, when 
even though we're implanting people and one is absolutely better than none, ideally two functioning ears to the best of their capacity is really where you're going to get the best benefit from your hearing and your brain's going to be happy because it's getting fed the input that it needs. So I think there's work to get done there. Uh, you know, it's great that children, a lot of children do get bilateral implants. Um, adults, it's probably a long way away. I think a lot of that is buried in the reimbursement issues that exist and the way policies are in today. So I would like to see a lot of movement in some of the policies that do make this technology, you know, for lack of a better word, prohibitive to many. Um, so I see that being a big front. I think maybe not in five years, but I'm hoping in 10 or 15 years, we'll see the hearing preservation rate for those individuals who have a lot more hearing to lose by going through a surgery get improved significantly. And, you know, that opens up a whole other avenue of different types of improvement and expectations that we should have. Um, the interesting, one of the interesting spaces for me is as we continue to expand indications is the treatment of unilateral hearing loss or SSD with cochlear implants. And I feel like that's at the far end of the spectrum. And we're going to learn so much as people continue to explore this treatment option with the FDA approvals and the insurers improving it. I think there's a lot to learn from that population about how to improve it for everyone else who has all these other types of hearing loss. Um, but that one is quite intriguing to me because I don't, I don't know. I don't know yet. I don't know. Yeah, well, it's it's, it's it not yet. as obvious as you don't hear from two ears. So let's right. get you up running right. again. It's like, well, you don't hear from one ear and what does that really mean? And I think certainly satisfaction is a huge part of that. And, mm -hmm. you know, when, you know, again, unilateral hearing loss, we know it's a deficit, but people are not, they're not aware of bilateral hearing loss. So then right. being aware of unilateral hearing loss and then yeah. the inconvenience <laughs> of the technology, which there is some, right. it, all of those things make it a much more complex treatment equation, interestingly. Right. And it seems that, you know, recipients are wearing it and are very happy. Um, it kind of gets stuck in my head. You know, I've treated and watch people get treated with implants. And we I'm always making, usually their poor ear pre-surgery, their better ear post-surgery. And with that UHL patient, the ear you're implanting will always be their poor ear because they have a totally normal ear on the other side. And, and that is a lot to wrap your head around as a professional that treats hearing loss, right? And so how is the brain integrating that? So again, I think it's very interesting and uh, really a lot more to learn on that front and um, see where it goes, right? It expands well, I think, the number you know, of with people. middle ear, a secular reconstruction, you know, that concept of intraoral difference and that you would still notice and what threshold mm -hmm. is that? I mean, there's, that's a kind of a basic model of the same concept, right? Like good what point. is yep. the intraoral difference that you are satisfied and part of it's yeah, counseling. Like the new ear, mm -hmm. the implanted ear is not going to hear like that other one. If that's what you want, you know, right. we, we don't have that yet. Maybe you guys will get right. that eventually, but we don't have that. Yep. Not yet, but I think everyone's striving to say, how would we get there someday? Yeah. You know, know I, I, what I hope is true medicalization of hearing loss, right? So, yep. you know, the, this concept that, you know, the answer is go get hearing aids to me is like crazy. Like you don't get hearing aids, you get your hearing loss treated with hearing aids, right? Yep. And so, and the, you know, some of the things that are afoot right now actually reaffirm that, that it's the technology, not the care and the technology. So it'll be interesting to see how the OTCs and if, uh, you know, we're for the timing of this recording where the uh, big uh, budget resolution bill hasn't been passed yet. So if, if hearing aid coverage is included in Medicare, it'll be interesting to see um, what those outcomes look like just from a hearing care point of view. Right. And I do applaud you for running your clinic. I did read your book and I think your philosophy is what medical hearing treatment should look like. I think you do a nice job at that. And um, I hope others start to move. I do see a lot of migration in that direction and interest and people coming from different factions, whether it's private practice audiology or other uh, physician practices looking to say, how do we really change the concern? the concept of, of how hearing loss is treated. So, right. or, or that it's treated, more. right? That right. You're not just, <laughs> given, a, <laughs> not just yeah. given an object, right? Like yeah. it actually Minor is treated. Omission. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, but I mean, it's kind of, it, it shows the bias, right? I mean, even right. the right. policymakers are like, you just need hearing aids. Well, I wish it were that simple, right? And, yep. and right. we're talking about 
the subtleties that you and I are discussing about treatment, like it's, it just doesn't make sense that you just treat it or you just put technology yeah. on it. And so it'll be interesting. Agree. Agree. And so that, that is that whole psychosocial side of med- that's to me fascinating about hearing loss is yep. that people don't actually know they have hearing loss. That's fascinating to me. The brain is amazing. Right. That's what right. I will say. I it thought is it was incredible. Doctor, I'm actually an ear brain doctor. I figured that out. <laughs> yes, you so are. Because you might be treating the periphery known as the ear, but it's the brain that you're really treating. So. Well, it's funny. I tell people this, like, you know, I've got a diagram in my office where it's like the whole ear. And then on the right hand side, there's a little thing that says brain. And like, so if you do it by scale, <laughs> the brain goes through the ceiling and through the floor. And I go, and look at that. We don't even like talk about it. Like, I mean, it's like, it is. Exactly. It is the right. thing, right? I mean, we're really just a uh, brain feeding system, right? Absolutely. I always say we're uh, hearing is just brain food, and that's really what it is. Yeah, and it, it is an amazing brain food. So that actually brings me to the question I ask everybody: What's your favorite sound? I, I love asking people this question. Oh well, you know, I'm a. I do love music. I know that that's a very broad thing, uh, but I like all types of music. But I would say I'm also a yogi, and I think uh, my breath and the breath of others is one of my favorite sounds, too. That's great. That's really great. Well, yeah. this has been great. I very much appreciate you uh, coming on and uh, sharing your perspective with us, Christina. Um, this is Christine Menape. She is the vice president of, oh, gosh, Regulatory Clinical Affairs. <laughs> and what's the third? Quality. Yeah, well, I, I uh, you know, I, I hope I hope you get three times the pay for the three different things. I right, we'll leave it. At that. <laughs> well, That's my you. wise. Act. That's my wise. Okay. Act. Anyway, if people wanted to get a hold of you, how would they get a hold of you? LinkedIn is that where they would find you or somewhere? Uh, else? Yeah, the- they could definitely find me on LinkedIn. Um, obviously, at Cochlear's website, I'm based here in Denver. Um, and then my email address is cmenapace at cochlear dot com. Happy to have people reach out to me that way too. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for coming on. This has been great. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Mark. Always great talking with you. Okay, have a good evening. Thanks for tuning in to the Listen Up podcast. We'll see you again next time. And be sure to click subscribe to get updates on future episodes.